Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Schiffman. How are you today, Matt? I'm good, Brian. It's hard to believe that it's December already, and uh, that means we're on our way to the Pegasus World Cup. Pegasus World Cup is, yeah, by my calendar, Matt, it's still over seven weeks away, but that's okay. It, at the very least, we don't know how long the Pegasus World Cup will be around. Obviously, this is only the second year, but at the very least, it's added a little excitement to uh, December, January racing season, which at times could could be a little mundane. So for that reason alone, the Pegasus World Cup is exciting. And I think uh, the perspective field that we're going to look at is uh, is a pretty nice list this year, Matt. But let's start with a horse we already knew was on the list. But he kind of underscored his viability as a candidate for the Pegasus World Cup with a big performance at the Cigar Cigar Mile, Matt. And I think I think I saw you there in the track feed, so I'm guessing you were there. I certainly was there, and uh, it it was a defining victory for uh, Sharp Azteca in that he finally got his uh, Grade One victory. And he, you know, and he ran against a very, very strong field, uh, as strong a field as uh, as he faced in the in the Breeders' Cup. Some of those same horses, and and he put on a, a performance uh, of his career when he defeated uh, Mind Your Biscuits and Practical Joke, easily coming down the stretch. Yes, it was easy, Matt. And first off, I'm very happy to to learn that that was not a doppelganger and that was, in fact, you at the Big A on Saturday. So that's good news for me. Secondly, Sharp Azteca, you know, it, he's put together a career. He's He's been a little underrated. I say this about good horses often, but Sharp Azteca was not uh, was not completely uh, appreciated or, or, or thought of as a real uh, strong candidate coming into the Pat Day Mile a year and a half ago. And all he does is run big races. I thought the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile was excellent. Uh, as the favorite, uh, we, we were talking about trying to beat him. I actually ended up singling him, although I didn't win because I didn't bet Catholic Boy. More on that later. Uh, Sharp Azteca is, is a really, really good horse. A really good miler, Matt. And one thing I think we should talk from this 115 buyer performance, giving weight, carrying 125 pounds, is the addition of a new jockey javier castellano replaced paco lopez paco lopez is a nice jockey javier castellano is a better jockey and it seemed to open up new avenues new dimensions and new possibilities for sharp as tackle who by the way matt is a horse we know likes Gulfstream park and certainly it was a move that the uh, that appeared that the ownership was making when they changed to javier castellano that they were hoping that they could get Sharp Sharp Azteca to sit off the pace a little bit. And that's exactly what happened. Javier had uh, Sharp Azteca in third place. And when he asked him to go, he just went right by that field. And and after the race, uh, uh, trainer Jorge Navarro said, you know, when, when you've got a really good horse, you should have one of the best jockeys on. And that's, it, it worked out perfectly. It did, and uh, I, I think by no means does this uh, signal the end of Sharp Azteca on the lead in his races, and maybe even on the lead in the Pegasus World Cup. But what it does is it shows that he, you know, he 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 hasn't been on the lead in every single race, but this was certainly his best rate and pounce performance of his career. It was his best overall performance of his career, as you mentioned. The field was more solid than I think people are giving. Uh, him credit for with mind your biscuits and practical joke and Tom's ready and and so on and so forth. It was a it was a good solid cigar mile field that he dominated. Again, 125 pounds. Now they have the option. Now they have the option with Javier Castellano with this proof is putting that he can uh, sit off the pace a little bit and make his move of uh, of seeing what the pace is like a little bit. And Javier Castellano is as good as anybody. At, uh, at reading the pace and saying, okay, I'll take the lead or I'll sit in second, third or fourth if the pace is a little hot as it was on Cigar Mile Day. So Sharp Azteca, 
uh, big performances before in his career at Gulfstream Park. Don't take him for granted. Obviously, he's not the favorite in the $16 million Pegasus World Cup. That falls on Gunrunner, who will be named Horse of the uh, Horse of the Year right around Pegasus World Cup time next January. Uh, but uh, Sharp Aztec is a horse not to be taken lightly, and this Cigar Mile, I think, is proof of that. Again, a 115 fire. Now, Matt, mind your biscuits, once again, was a little closer to the pace. I've seen him uh, do this in a few races recently. I think he's better as a one-run closer. I think he was forced into that because of needing to chase Sharp Aztec a little bit. Uh, not a bad performance, though, but a well-beaten second. Practical joke. Well beaten third. Tom's ready. Worse than that, as they finish their career. Any thoughts on those three? Yeah, like you said, uh, it was a little disappointing with Practical Joke uh, that uh, and third, nothing, uh, nothing wrong with finishing third. But like you said, um, he really wasn't in contention coming down the stretch. Going down the back stretch, he started to make a move, and it looked like uh, Practical Joke was was uh, going to be coming, but. Uh, on, on that day, I don't think that the aqueduct surface was a was a track that was playing kind to deep deep closers, and I think that played into the into the move that Mind Your Biscuits made, also along with the fact that they were worried about letting Sharp Azteca get too far ahead. But nothing to be embarrassed about with with Mind Your Biscuits. Trainer Chad Summers was happy with the performance of his horse after the race and he's going to keep running next year which is a good thing yeah this track was also not playing very fast matt so the 135 carrying 125 pounds very impressive i agree with you and chad summers mind your biscuit ran it biscuits ran a good race it'll be interesting to see what direction they had they've got a lot of options as they bring back the top new york bread next year for 2018 uh, the uh, the immediate question is whether mind your biscuits. Summers has talked about stretching this horse out. The immediate question is whether they'll stretch him out for nine furlongs at Gulfstream Park. If you're going to do nine furlongs, Gulfstream Park is not a bad place to stretch out to. And uh, there will be, as we're going to talk more, there's going to be a strong pace in this Pegasus World Cup. It sure looks like that anyway. So maybe mind your biscuits as a, a potential long shot in the... Uh, Pegasus World Cup, if they choose to go that way, might be an interesting horse. Yeah, it certainly might be interesting uh, for Biscuits, but he's got plenty of options uh, throughout the year in the spring. They'll probably shoot for the Met Mile and, and prep races into there also. Yeah, if they shoot for the Met Mile, he might run into one Sharp Aztec again. And we know Sharp Aztec is going to the Pegasus World Cup, Matt. We talked about Gunrunner a little bit. Gunrunner made his first workout this weekend uh, down in the fairgrounds, his winter home after just a wonderful season last year. Uh, he won five races easily. He was second in the Dubai World Cup. He won his last four races in authoritative style, all grade ones, culminating with that big performance in the Breeders' Cup Classic where he was hounded by Collected the whole way and still had plenty left in the stretch to win clearly the Breeders' Cup Classic, clinching a horse of the year and doing it on a track that wasn't too favoring of speed. So all in all, Gunrunner, a very, very deserving horse of the year. And now he's getting ready with all sights pointing to Gulfstream Park. He had to miss it last year. Not so this year. $16 million on the line. Gunrunner, if he runs his race, is the horse to beat in the Pegasus World Cup. Without question. And you know, Brian, you, you got to tip your hat to Gunrunner and to uh, Steve Asmussen and to the Connections of the horse since he won since he broke his maiden back in i think it was in 2015 towards the end of that year he has been steadily running without any significant injury without any significant time off and doing what he's doing getting better and better and better over all that time and maybe because of that he sometimes he hasn't gotten the credit and attention. I think he wrote about this the other day that uh, uh, that I think he deserves. Uh, Arrogate came along in the course of there and got a lot of attention, and now Sharp Aztec is getting attention. Gun Runner is one tough horse that deserves all of our respect, and he's going to be very hard to beat in the Pegasus World Cup. 
can't disagree with anything you just said, Matt. Gunrunner's had a marvelous career. Pegasus World Cup looks to be his final career race, and uh, what better to, uh, way to go out than a big win there? Uh, that would be his fifth straight grade one win. That would be his richest win, and that would just put a feather, a cherry, if you will, on the uh, on the Sunday that was his horse of the year season. Looking back at that Breeders' Cup Classic, there are some horses that ran a good race, and they are pointing for the Pegasus World Cup, Matt. Uh, second place was Collected. Third place was West Coast. Fourth place, War Story. Uh, Arrogate and Gun, uh, Gunavera next. And uh, other than Arrogate, they are all pointing to the Pegasus World Cup on January 27 at Gulfstream Park, nine furlongs. I'm going to say this. Uh, if Collected, again, is the more... Uh, speedy of the two Baffert horses that ran second and third in the Breeders' Cup Classic, I think that maybe West Coast uh, could be the most viable candidate to upset Gunrunner in the Pegasus. And I say this for a few reasons. First off, he was a three-year-old last year. Most of the other horses we're talking about are already older, a little bit more experienced. West Coast obviously moved forward the second half of the year. And uh, I think there might be a little bit more under the hood for him still. He didn't fire his best shot down the lane of the Breeders' Cup Classic, but still uh, well enough to be third in that race. A little improvement for the uh, maturing West Coast. Maybe he becomes an interesting candidate as well. He certainly does. I agree with what you said. I mean, there is, I guess, a little bit of a question mark. He's not back in full training yet, hasn't posted an official work yet. I don't know if that means anything, but I certainly in the next week or so we'll need to start seeing more from west coast if he's probably going to be ready for the uh pegasus world cup and i just want to say one more thing about gunrunner also don't forget i think nine furlongs is gunrunner's best distance yeah and gulfstream park's a track he's never run at but you would think it fits his style pretty darn well too now sharp azteca uh, collected a few others so the pace should be strong, but he's proven he can handle that as well. So, yeah, gun runner, horse to beat. What, what's making this race even a little bit more interesting, especially what's happened the last week, what's tr transpired down in South Florida, we knew Forever Unbridled. Uh, Forever Unbridled will be the older mare dirt champion from 2017. She hasn't lost a race since a very good performance in the Breeders' Cup distaff of 2016. We knew she was headed. Uh, to the breeder uh, to the Pegasus World Cup, but now we found out that Stellar Wind very well could join her. Uh, at first glance, it seems like an odd decision. Coolmore paid, uh, I believe it was six million for her. Uh, one of the uh, big sales in in Kentucky here in November, and now uh, you know Coolmore. Coolmore is a bunch of smart people. They're saying, well, we paid six million for her. Let's see if we can get that back right away. And she still has time to uh, to hit the breeding shed in uh, in a few months after the Pegasus World Cup. So Stellar Wind is down in South Florida. Good chance she'll end up in the Pegasus World Cup. And who is training her now, Matt? Uh, training her is Chad Brown, so the hottest trainer in the country. Uh, and of course, Chad trains horses for Coolmore, and and apparently uh, immediately after they bought the horse. They said that this was this was their plan. So this wasn't something that just you know popped up uh, in in the last couple of weeks. I guess they've been wanting to do this all along. I don't know. I find it really curious because it's not like Stellar Wind is coming off a big effort in the Breeders' Cup Distaff. Certainly a race you might be able to draw a line through considering her her career resume. For whatever reason, she didn't show up in the Breeders' Cup Distaff of 2017. She had previously, uh, especially as a three-year-old, she had run so many good races. Very consistent daughter of Curlin. Uh, if she runs her race, I think she is a threat in here. And with all that money, why not? Uh, like, like I said, she still has time to visit the breeding shed. On the other hand, Forever Unbridled, we expect back uh, for a full season this year, uh, Fipke and Stewart. And Forever Unbridled, another horse maybe that has just gone under the radar just a little bit, Matt. She really is a force coming down the lane. We saw it in all three of her starts in 2017. I think back to Saratoga. Say what you will about Songbird uh, as far as her health in the race. Songbird ran a good race in the first Lenson. 
but Forever Unbridled was just an unstoppable uh, moving object down the lane, and you knew she was just going to reel in Songbird that afternoon in Saratoga. And there is no question that the, that Forever Unbridled is going to get the right kind of setup in the race. Of course, she's running against the boys and never run against the boys before. But, uh, you know, as we see in Europe uh, all the time, uh, the girls beat the boys over there. When you're talking about quality horses, you're talking about really good horses, regardless of their gender. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, you know, uh, in years past, 42 years ago, um, more recently in a Kentucky Derby, there have been some very unfortunate things to top-notch fillies while they were running against males. But Matt, that basically that was just bad luck uh, in, in my mind. I would like to see uh, some of our best female horses run against the males. We certainly saw Zenyatta and Rachel Alexander do it very successfully. And uh, Forever Unbridled and, and Stella Wind, you know, I don't know that they're in that class. In fact, I know that they're not quite in that class, but they're very good older mares. $16 million, why not give them a shot? I think it's good for the sport. It makes the race a little bit more interesting. Who else did, haven't we talked about for the Pegasus World Cup? Madden, uh, Seeking the Soul won the Clark. Uh, same uh, connections as Forever Unbridled. I don't know if either of us were too thrilled about his win there. It was his first graded stakes win. Neolithic uh, ran third in this race last year. Uh, not sure if either of those excite me as long shot possibilities, though, frankly. Right, but Neolithic is another horse that likes Gulfstream Park, and we should also talk about another horse that loves Gulfstream Park that may be in the Pegasus, and that's Gunavera. Yeah, Gunavera was one of that list of horses uh, that was in the Breeders' Cup Classic going straight to the uh, straight to the Pegasus World Cup, and Gunavera, yeah, he, he likes Gulfstream. Remember how he opened the season last year at Gulfstream Park, so Gunavera like Forever Unbridled, Mind Your Biscuits, Seeking the Soul, a few of these horses that want to make one big run. They should have some speed to run at. So Gunavera, just like West Coast, maybe he's better at four than he was at three and, and, and look out in a spot like this. One other horse that interests me just a little bit, and he's, he's not my usual horse that I want to mention, but that's Prime Attraction. We don't know for sure that he's going to run in the Pegasus World Cup. They need to get a spot for him. Uh, but that that can always be worked out as as owners are looking to uh, to get rid of these spots that they purchase for big money. But anyway, Prime Attraction, uh, son of unbridled song out of an AP Indy mare. If you've seen him up close in person, or if you've seen him uh, run one of his races, very impressive, physical looking horse. Obviously, his last race was his best yet. It was the Native Diver. There were some decent horses in there, and Prime Attraction really did uh, dominate the race pretty well. Uh, I, I'm remembering Moop Dehij was third in there. But anyway, it was kind of a return to dirt with that breeding. Uh, every reason to think he might be a, a horse who can develop and really be get, get good with maturity. I liked what I saw in the Native Diver. If I'm just looking at long shots in the Pegasus World Cup, he, he becomes one of the more interesting ones for me, Matt. And that one will probably be a very big long shot, Brian. Okay, I'll, I'll take that as a full endorsement from you, Matt. But uh, yeah, if I'm looking at uh, 30 to 1 shots to throw yep. in the exotics in the Pegasus World Cup, take a look at that native diver performance by a son of unbridled song out of an AP indie mare who looks like a million bucks. All right, Matt, that's our Pegasus World Cup early look, but we should still talk a little bit Kentucky Derby, wouldn't you say? I think we absolutely should. We'll... We'll probably have stuff almost every weekend as we uh, head to the first Saturday in May. And at Aqueduct, it was the Remsen Stakes. And a nice field was put together there. And, and you mentioned the winner just briefly earlier in the show. And that was Catholic Boy, who uh, uh, is a horse who's trained uh, by Jonathan Thomas, who is a former assistant of Todd Pletcher. And... This is a horse who had been running on the turf, finished fourth in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf, making a very nice run. And, and I, like you, Brian, uh, said, ah, this is a turf horse. I didn't include him in, uh, in my, the pick four that I played after catching a nice price in the first leg. And I'm going to tell you, a Catholic boy took to the dirt uh, splendidly, and I was very impressed with his performance. 
Yeah, I was too, Matt. Uh, Jonathan Thomas, a new trainer, as you said, a former Pletcher assistant, Manny Franco, road Catholic boy, perfectly, I thought, because I worried uh, that he was farther off the pace in those turf races that he had run, and I, and I didn't know if that would translate as well to a slower pace at nine furlongs on the aqueduct dirt. No worries. He just proved that he's the best horse in the race. Uh, he was a clear second choice at four to one, the son of more than Ravi, who just continues to churn out good horses, top sire, turf, or dirt. Uh, Catholic boy, yeah, he ran a very good race. I might take exception to you calling it a very nice field. I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure that it's going to translate well at all with what we saw in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, for instance. Maybe, maybe not. But Catholic Boy looks like the real deal, at least as a graded stakes horse on either surface. Um, you also mentioned he was fourth in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf. I don't know that that tells the story of how good he is on turf because he ran two very, very good races on the East Coast on turf. And then in the Juvenile Turf, he lost by, by about a length and a half. So, uh, as I said before the race, certainly one of the best juvenile turf horses in the country. Now we know he can dirt. He looks as good on dirt probably as turf. So uh, the future's bright no matter where they decide to go. The lure of the Kentucky Derby is huge, so I imagine they will give him more chances on the dirt. Uh, time was 152.5. It sounds very slow. As I mentioned earlier in the show, though, Aqueduct wasn't playing fast that day. So move it up a little bit. And, and the, the Philly Wonder Godot, who won the uh, Demoiselle pretty easily, uh, ran almost a second and a half slower than did Catholic Boys. So a strong performance, a four and three quarter length win. Uh, Avery Island was second best. Um, nice national winner, the favorite in the Remsen. Probably uh, followed up on that race with a similar type of performance to beat the rest, but not good enough to beat a top turf horse. Yeah, and uh, Thomas, after the race, said they're going to send uh, Catholic Boy down to their home base, which is on Bridalwood Farm in Ocala. That's where Thomas trains all of his horses out of, and they'll keep him in training there, and, and they're going to they're gonna take their shot down the Derby Trail now. Absolutely, and I think Bridalwood is uh, also a piece of a horse that was scratched as well, uh, the uh, Mucho Macho Man half-brother, Matt, I'm, the name is escaping me right now. The Tappet Mucho Macho Man half-brother, uh, who's only run second in his main race. He didn't make the Rems, and we thought he might or maybe not. Uh, so we'll see him down the road, too. What's his name, Matt? Marconi. Marconi. That's the, how could I forget Marconi? All right. Uh, speaking of two-year-olds, impressive two-year-olds, I think we should mention Noble Indy, first of all. Noble Indy is a son of Take Charge. Indy, Todd Pletcher, uh, Windstar Farm homebred, was not well liked at the sale, was an RNA for 45000 as a yearling. Clearly, that was a mistake. Uh, they bet him down to, to three to two, I think, in this seven furlong maiden at Gulfstream, and he, he threw in a pip. He sure did. And, you know, this is a, this is a crucial time for uh, Pletcher and his two year olds. It's a, he, he's had several two year olds like, uh, Noble Indy, who have shown well in their first start, and now they'll have to get better and and uh, make hay on the Derby Trail when the calendar turns in January. Absolutely. he's He's got some questions as far as distance breeding on the female side, perhaps. Take Charge Indy, though, I do like as a classic, a potential classic sire. Uh, he won by more than eight lengths. Fractious in the gate before the race, but he won by more than eight lengths in a very fast time, 122 down there at Gulfstream Park this weekend. Speaking of impressive first out winners, Matt, we got to start talking about McKenzie again. McKenzie was actually the third choice in the Kentucky Derby future wager among the single entrants uh, behind only uh, the top two two-year-olds in the country, uh, Good Magic and Bolt Doro. So obviously people liked what they saw in that debut performance uh, in October at Santa Anita. Uh, McKenzie, a son of Street Sense, will be stretching out for the mile 16th Los Alamitos Futurity on Saturday. And it looks like Baffert will be one, two, as far as the favorites, because he also has the juvenile runner-up Solomini in there in what looks to be a pretty small field. Yeah, small field, but it's going to be a test already for McKinsey, because as you said, Brian, it's going to be two turns. It's going to be a mile and a 16th. And Solomini is, uh, 
is a nice horse. Um, if you folks remember, Zayat Stables was purchased for a couple hundred thousand dollars, finished second in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. And that means that he was behind Good Magic, a horse that we have a lot of respect for. And he beat Baldoro in there, another horse that we have a lot of respect for. Um, Salamini's got an experience edge. Uh, and the other possible horses in there have some talent. So uh, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, we'll get a we'll get a little bit of a reading on the quality of McKinsey uh, right here in his second start. Absolutely. I expect him to go off favorite, Matt, off his hype. Solomini certainly has uh, experience around the distance and, and more races under the belt. So it's a it's a good, solid acid test. Yeah, uh, Gravitas was uh, impressive winning recently. The Hollendorf for two-year-old, also impressive maiden winner. Uh, Runaway Ghost coming down from uh, from a nice win up north in uh, San Francisco is in there. So just just in those five, I don't know how many more will be in the field, but just in those five, you got five potential winners. McKinsey will have to be good in order to win this grade one race in his second career start. So we have that to look forward to on Saturday as well as the Starlet. We'll be talking about both of those races next week on Horse Center. As always, folks, Matt and I both want to thank you for watching on a weekly basis. We get so many great comments and a few not so great comments that we don't mind at all, too. Nothing wrong with a, a, a differing opinion from our viewers out there. But anyway, thank you for watching. Thank you to our sponsor, Derby Wars, the best contest site out there. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel here on Horse Racing Nation. Matt, can I get a closing shot from you on this rainy Tuesday here in Kentucky? Uh, it's raining a little bit up here in New Jersey also. And as always, I want to thank our producer, Brett. Borkman. Thank you, Brett. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week on another edition of Horse Center.